I'm currently working on building a car audio system that has three amplifiers, six speakers, four subwoofers, and a DSP. Now, of course, for all of this gear to work, we need to wire it, but with having so many different items, how do we go about doing so? What size and type of wires do we need, and what is something that a ton of people are forgetting in today's latest vehicles? Hey guys, I'm Mark. Welcome to Car Audio Fabrication, the show where together we learn how to master car audio and how to design, build, and install our dream car audio system. In this video, we're in the design stage, planning out our electrical system. Let's get started. The first thing we wanna do is lay out all of the gear for our system. Now we could use simple pencil and paper. In this case, I'm using an iPad so that it's really visual for you guys. Let's take a look at the gear that we have. If you guys watched the last video that I uploaded on YouTube, I went over all the gear that I'm using for the system. So I'll just give you a brief overview. We've got two different two channel amplifiers and each of these are powering a set of speakers. So up front we have component speakers and then in the back, we have coaxial style speakers. We then have a 1500 watt amplifier that's going to be powering four 10 inch subwoofers. We want to be able to control the time alignment, the crossovers and all the equalization for each of these channels in order to get the best performance. So we're gonna be using a digital signal processor. So we have all the gear laid out and I also like to draw a battery on this drawing. That way we can start to visualize all of our connections. At this point of our planning, we're gonna keep things really simple. We don't wanna be concerned about wire size yet. We're going to do the calculations for that later. We don't want to be worried about lengths of the wire or anything like that. We're just going to make our simple connections. And we're going to start with making all of the positive connections from the battery to each of the amplifiers. So I've drawn in those wires and the reason I left a space here is I know that I want to use some form of distribution block. A distribution block allows us to have one large wire coming in and anytime we're stepping down to smaller wires we want to make sure that we fuse those wires. So this is a fused distribution block that we're going to be using. These fuses go like this. Here's an example of one of the fuses that would mount to this. So we're leaving space for that right there. In fact, to make things more visual, I'll just drop that picture in. Next, let's plan each of our ground connections. So I've drawn in the different ground connections using these black lines, and you guys can see that I've also added a ground distribution block. A quick side note, that's why I like this distribution block from show sponsor, New Concepts. This is called the basic three-way distribution block. Like I mentioned earlier, you can use this as a positive distribution block by putting the fuses on it, but they also sell these links here. And by using these links instead of the fuses, you can turn this into a ground distribution block. The other thing that's really neat, and you might have noticed this earlier, there's actually two different inputs. And this is so that you can connect to this second input here and you can daisy chain another one of these if you wanted to, or you could send another connection to a different type of fuse distribution block. We're gonna be talking about that more shortly. I'll be using New Concepts wiring on this whole build. If you guys wanna learn more about them, definitely check out the link down in the video description. Now here's the big mistake that some people make with today's latest vehicles. Now typically you would take this ground distribution block and you would simply just make a ground connection in your vehicle. And we can label that by using this logo here. The problem though is this particular build is for a Ford F-150 and if you're familiar with that vehicle, that vehicle has an all aluminum body, which means that grounding in this way is not the best idea. Instead, what we're going to want to do is actually make a connection that goes right back to the negative terminal of the battery under the hood. But aluminum body vehicles aren't the only vehicles you have to watch out for. Some vehicles just use different adhesive techniques in order to hold the different parts of the vehicle together so it's not always going to be a good ground to just attach to the metal of the vehicle you should always check the quality of your ground if you want to learn more about that process i have a full video about it that you can check out up here so we now have a power and ground connection on all of our amplifiers so we're good to go there but we do need to provide power also to the dsp and any other accessories in our system so to do that i've actually added another fuse block here and this is a smaller fuse block for much smaller fuses because we're going to be using much smaller wiring for each of those devices. And you can see that I've ran a power connection to that along with also a ground connection. We wouldn't want to ground this smaller fuse block in the typical 
minimal way of grounding to the body because like I mentioned earlier, F-150 aluminum body, in that case, we're gonna ground back to the distro block that is also going to ground back to the battery. All of our power connections are complete. Now we wanna draw in each of the speaker wire connections that's going to connect our speakers to our amplifiers. First off on the speakers, you are going to want to consider if you're connecting them in a component style configuration or if you are using the passive crossover that comes with them is that will impact the amount of wire that you're going to need lengthwise. Definitely consider this later in the process when we're measuring out our lengths. The same goes for our subwoofers. If we have multiple different voice coils that need to connect in different configurations, definitely consider that. Usually a good idea to get more wiring than you need. The final wiring we should draw in is all of our different signal wires. In this case, I'm gonna be using RCA connections from the head unit to the DSP and then to the amps. So quite a bit of signal connection to go here. Let's draw it in. So in my case, I have an aftermarket head unit and I'm going to use a single line for each left to right pair of signal. So in this case, I have two lines going from the radio to the DSP and that's because I want to retain the front to rear fading capability. So I'm going to have the front left right and then the rear left right. Out of the DSP, I need a left-right signal going to the first amplifier for the front speakers. I then need a left-right signal going to the second two-channel amplifier for the rear speakers. And then I'll have a mono signal going into the subwoofer amp. So there it is. We've got a visual breakdown of all of the major wiring for our system. But now we need to get into those calculations so that we can determine what size wiring we need and if we need to upgrade our alternator and other aspects of our electrical system. So the first math formula we need to know is that current, which is I, equals power over voltage. So first we're going to determine what P is. So that's our total system power. And this is really easy. We're just going to add up all of the different power wattages in watts RMS from our amplifiers. And we wanna make sure that we look them up based on the ohm load that we are using each of these amplifiers at. As an example, these two channel amps can do 100 watts per channel if it's ran at two ohms. But in my case, I'm gonna be using a passive crossover and running this component speaker set at four ohms. And each of these amps is 75 watts times two at four ohms, which means each amp here is 150 watts. Now, what about our subwoofer amplifier? This amp is a little bit unique. It can do 1500 watts at one ohm, or it can also do it at two ohms. You wanna determine what your subwoofers are going to be wired at. That's a separate video right there. But once you do determine that, and in this case, I'm gonna be using as much power out of this amp as possible, and this is 1500 watts. So we need to take each of these values and add it together. So in my case, 1500 plus 150 plus 150 is 1800 watts. Now for our voltage, this is simple. We want to use the voltage of the system when it's running. And for most all vehicles, that's going to be 14.4 volts. So now we're simply going to find the current that we need in order to power this system. So we're gonna do 1800 divided by 14.4 and in my case, this is 125 amps. Now it gets a little bit more complex though, because this 125 amps assumes that our amplifiers are 100% efficient. And there is no such thing as a 100% efficient amplifier. Every amplifier will have some losses due to heat and other inefficiencies. So in other words, the current that goes into those amps in order to produce the total 1800 watts actually needs to be larger than 125 amps. So based on the type of amplifier you're using, the efficiency is going to be a little bit different. In this case, these are all class D amps, so we can assume a value of 80% efficiency. So to do this math, we take 125 amps and we're going to divide it by 0.8, which is our efficiency, and that gives us 156. Now, every time I mention this in one of the electrical planning videos, people always get confused. I wanna stress that the reason that this number is bigger is because you need a larger current going in than you can ever possibly have coming out. So I assure you that the math here is correct, Instead of needing 125 amps total, we're going to need 156. Now this is where we need to do some electrical system planning. A good idea is to go on an auto parts website, put in the year, make and model of your vehicle and look for a replacement alternator. A lot of times this will tell you the size of the OEM alternator in your vehicle. In my case, in this vehicle, the OEM alternator is 225 amps. So that tells us that although we're going to be using quite a bit of the capacity of that alternator, 
we're going to probably be okay. But there is a lot of times that you guys will do this calculation and you'll find that it's going to be larger than what your alternator is. And that's not the end of the world. Let me explain why. Let's say that you looked up your alternator and you find that it's actually an 150 amp alternator and your math here was 156 amps. You would think, okay, there's no possible way I could ever have enough power going into this system in order to power it. What's important to understand here though is that it's going to be very, very rare that we're actually using the full output from each of these different amplifiers. Let me explain what I mean by that. In order to actually get 150 watts of power out of these amplifiers, which they are definitely capable of doing, you would literally be playing a straight sine wave. I don't know about you, but when I'm driving around in my car, I don't just sit there and listen to a thousand hertz. I listen to music and music is dynamic. And what that means is for the vast majority of the time, you're not going to be using the full 150 watts out of each of these amps. For the vast majority of the time, you're not gonna be using the full 1500 watts out of the subwoofer amplifier. Now this does change depending on your listening preferences. If you're just using your system for fun as a daily driver, yes, you might turn it up all the way, but again, you're playing music, so you're not using these full power numbers. Now, if you're going and competing with the system, then it's a different story. If you're competing and literally playing sine waves on your subwoofers and trying to set the best SPL score, in that case, you would be using the max power output of your amps. So this is something that you have to consider and this is where these numbers that I'm about to explain come into play. So in my opinion, there's two different types of way to look at this. If you consider yourself a bass heavy listener, in other words, you like that music that has those long, really emphasized bass notes that basically are a sine wave within the music, just straight up playing a particular frequency, I would probably consider myself a bass heavy listener. And in this case, you want to use a 50% multiplier. So what you wanna do is you wanna take the current into the amplifiers, 156, and we're going to multiply it by 0.5 because we're a 50% bass heavy listener. And that tells us that we're gonna be using about 78 amps. This approximation gives us a much more realistic value that we will actually be using from the alternator. Now, in contrast, what if you're an average listener? You like to turn it up from time to time, but it's not like you're constantly just ripping on it. You love having an upgraded system. You like having it nice and clear, but in this case, we want to use more of a 25% multiplier. So we would do that 156 amps multiplied by 0.25 for our 25% multiplier and that's going to give us 39 amps. So in my case having that 225 amp alternator and you know obviously this system is intended to be a little bit more bass heavy with the four tens we could use this multiplier here. So using 78 amps of the alternator's capacity, we're going to be good to go. Now we're gonna talk about power wire sizing and speaker wire sizing in a second here, but a few more notes. So it is always a good idea to do the big three upgrade. If you guys wanna learn more about that, I talk about it in this related video. And again, by all means, if you are using this system to compete and you do feel that you're going to absolutely be using all of that power at all times out of your amps, definitely feel free to upgrade the alternator as needed. Now, as far as sizing our power wiring goes, we can use this same formula from earlier, but in this case, we're going to use it for each of the different amps. So we're gonna do power over voltage. So I did 150 over 14.4, and then I again used that 80% efficiency divider, and that gave me 13 amps of current is going to be needed going into each of the mids and highs amplifier. And then we need 130 amps going into our subwoofer amplifier. And you can double check your math here because if you add these three values, they should add up to our value that we calculated earlier of 156, in this case they do. So obviously that means we need 156 amps of current coming into our distribution block and 156 amps coming out divided on each of those legs. And keep in mind that current flows in a circuit, so all of those values will be the same for the ground side. Knowing those values, we could check our manufacturer's website for our wiring. And in this case, if we look at the New Concepts website, we could see some of the max current loads on this wire here. If I zoom in on the one knot or zero gauge wire, we can use 375 amps. On the four gauge, we could use 150 amps. And on the eight gauge, we could use 60 amps. So this 156 amps means that we're going to be in the zero gauge category. So I'm gonna put a zero there. And then each of these, I could technically use eight gauge, but just to be safe, 
It never hurts to oversize the wire, so I'm gonna use four gauge on each of the mids and highs amps. And because the run will actually be pretty short between my distribution block, which will be mounted on the amplifier rack and the subwoofer amp, I might use four gauge there, but again, just to be safe, it doesn't hurt to oversize, so I'll probably use zero gauge on that run as well. Now do keep in mind that any wire size that you use on the positive side, it's a full circuit, so we wanna do that same on the ground side as well. Now as far as speaker wire goes, we want to keep things simple here because the calculations for speaker wire are a little bit more complex, but generally speaking, the speaker wire lengths in a car audio system are usually about the same. They're never like extremely long or anything where we need to step the size up really just based on the length. So I'm going to give you some general rules of thumb here. If you're using less than 150 watts per channel on your speakers, you're going to be just fine using either 14 or even 16 gauge wire. On your subwoofers, usually the speaker wire lengths are even shorter, so if you're using less than 1000 watts per sub, you're going to be just fine with 12 gauge speaker wire. If you are using over 1000 watts per subwoofer, that's when you definitely want to consider stepping up to 10 gauge or 8 gauge. In order to determine the length of each of these different wires in the system, whether it's speaker wires or RCA signal wires or your power wires, to do that, if you wanna be super accurate in particular, and if you're on a budget, what you can do is you can just use a piece of string and kind of lay it in the general location in the vehicle, lay it throughout the length, and then obviously measure that length and add everything up. If you wanna just approximate more quickly and you're not as concerned about having an exact length, what you can do is just kind of use a tape measure and just kind of eyeball it. And then I generally like to add 10 to 15% to the total. That way you make sure that you have more than enough wire it's probably better off to go with this approach because it never hurts to have a little bit of extra. The other electrical system thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to pick out your fuse sizes. And I have a full video explaining that Again, link up in the corner. So question of the episode, and this is kind of a random one, but I wanna hear from you guys. What is your dream car audio system? No budget, no restrictions, what would you get? Let me know, I'd love to hear it. When you are picking out the wiring and the different wire distribution pieces, definitely consider show sponsor new concepts. You guys can learn more about them at the link down in the video description. A special thanks to them for being a monthly channel sponsor, making these videos possible, and a thank you to Bart, Mike, Ali, Jerry, Marcos, William, and the rest of the Patreon membership team. A big thanks to all those guys, and thank you for watching.